Oh, hello. Here we are. <laughs> well, that was uh, that was surprising. We didn't get the we didn't get the show intro, but uh, hey, everybody, yeah. hope uh, hope you guys have a good had a good week. Um, we're excited to be back with you guys for another episode of Holding Water. We got two fantastic guests here uh, with us tonight. I'm going to talk a lot about culture, uh, rivalries, and uh, just some great uh, swim coaches. Brian, what you been up to, man? Just got done with practice. We uh, just went 1230 to 2.30. So, you know, the beauties of COVID get to practice on Sundays, making up for That's Is that something you guys do weekly, every Sunday? We have been because we also have high school season going on. So we've been missing um, pretty much every Thursday. We're out of the pool because we're not allowed to be in there when they're doing the high school meets. So uh, we used to be able to sneak some groups in pre-COVID during the high school meets. Um, but now with obvious social distancing restrictions, that's not an option. So we've basically moved our Thursdays to Sundays um, and gone from there. So that's the what I was doing. Pretty- your attendance for stuff like that been pretty good? Um, you know, some days you lose some kids because of, uh, you know, church and, you know, other family activities and things like that. Um, but it's pretty good. I mean, it's consistent. I mean, I have a handful of kids I know that are not going to be there on Sunday. Yeah. Um, and part think- of the reason I moved it to 1230 was because I have a bunch that get done with church at noon. So they were able to get there by 1230. So that's why I do it at 1230. Um, but I think yeah, we, got two, uh, we got two guests today that uh, I'd love to know for them, you know, with all the COVID stuff there, the changes that they've had to make to their practice schedules and their facilities and what's going on. So uh, you want to introduce those guys to uh, to everybody out there? Sure, man, the first guy is uh, a guy I've known for, geez, since the mid-90s. Um, Back, back, way back, um, we kind of grew up coaching together in Florida. Um, had a had a great career at the Bulls School with the Bulls School and the Bulls School Sharks, and now he's actually working with me, working with us up in Lakeside, um, coaching the same groups across town as me. Um, John Sakovich. there he is, John. Hey, John, Tyler, Brian, thank you guys then, for uh, bringing me on the show. I appreciate it. Looking forward to the conversation today. And then our other guest is uh, a guy that, you know, I actually don't know him very well, um, but I've met him a handful of times when we've conversed, but I've always had a ton of respect for him just in the way he handles himself and the way that he handles his teams. And, um, you know, he's done a fantastic job. He's been down there in the Miami area forever, too. Um, and uh, I'm not even going to attempt to say his last name, <laughs> but um, Mariusz from Pinecrest. <laughs> hey, Kyle and Brian. Thanks for having me. John, my friend. How you doing, Marius? Good to see you again. So basically, um, you know, I knew you two guys were friends, and I knew you guys kind of developed that friendship through, you know, your your positions at Bowles and your position at Pinecrest, and that, you know, the kind of, you know, kind of started from that rivalry, I think. I don't know. Correct me if I'm wrong. That's kind of the impression that I've got. We we swam against each other. Oh, you guys swam against each other. So you guys have known each other from way back. Yep. Um, I think uh, I think my earliest memory of, of Marius, and not that we had met yet, but was uh, world champs in Perth uh, when we were lining up for the athlete parade and Poland was like, I don't know, right in front of us or right behind us. And I remember Artur and Marius and a couple other guys were talking about stuff. Um but I remember racing against Marius at NC two A's and the two free and uh, well, that was, two free was probably the only event I could even get close to him. Five free and mile. He was a little further. <laughs> so. But then, um, you know, once he got down to Miami and I started to see him pretty regularly, we, you know, connected that friendship. And then when he was at Pinecrest and, you know, me at Bulls just kind of um, really solidified it and, and allowed us that opportunity to be, you know, really good friends, but at the same time, you know, very competitive rivals. Um, but I think in a very uh, positive and, and, and contributing manner to the athletes as well as to our coaching. You know, and, and I will second that, um, you know, having coached uh, uh, in a team concept between colleges and, and, and high schools when the team concept is really a, the forefront of what we do um it's you know it's it's refreshing um 
to have a healthy rivalry and have a complete respect for your opposite uh, uh, coaching staff and a school and organization. And um, I know it's not always the case in every situation, but uh, with John and I, it just came naturally. It was it was a really a great um, uh, mutual respect and relationship. And you know, we got spanked more often than than not, but uh, it was always it was always in a in a in a great fun and with great respect. And um, you know, it, it's. I, I, I enjoy and I miss having John around. That's for sure. It was, uh, you know, we always look forward to swimming Pinecrest because we knew we knew we were going to get top-notch competition. I mean, we knew that we never, ever went into Pinecrest thinking, you know, yeah, we got them beat. I mean, it was always, guys, look, you know, they want to beat us. I mean, there's no doubt about that. And they, they swam to their utmost best as well. And we knew we were getting excellent competition. And, you know, for us, that was probably the best tune up for the state meet possible because that was the best competition we got. And, you know, and, and some years it was real close and a couple of years, their girls beat our girls. And, uh, you know, it, it was fun. It was exciting. And our kids look forward to it every year. You know, it was one of my favorite trips for sure. Yeah, this year was the first year we didn't go up north um, for our normal meets for obvious reasons. And uh, it's, it's you know, everything is so different. But, I, you know, I do remember going back every, um, you know, every September for, for a meet and, um, you know, looking forward to not only competition, but talking to John and, um, and you know, having the tune-up uh, beginning of the season and then being able to see them a few months later was a great reference point to see where we at and where they at, um, you know. Uh, Difficult to hide anything, but always going to a state meet, things happened, uh, uh, you know, in a variety of ways you didn't expect. So, guys, in a uh, in a show for for coaches out there that are that are um, developing their own team culture, going through all of the challenges that are happening through the COVID stuff right now, what would you say were the uh, most important things? Uh, for your teams individually, what were you trying to instill in the culture of your team for you guys to have continued success? I mean, I think for me, it was um, one, redirecting the athletes back to remembering why they swam. Um, you know, it, it would have been very easy to go find something else to do you know, take up instruments, play another sport or whatever. Um, you know, and we didn't lose anybody over, over the COVID, which was, which was awesome. It was great. And I think one of the things we talked about one, as we were doing our zoom dry lands over and over, was just, you know, Hey, remember, we will get back into the pool. And, and this is something that you guys have chosen to do and you guys love doing, um, you know, let's let's remember that. Let's look forward to that opportunity to get back into the pool. And the number of athletes that, you know, it had said that they don't want to, you know, ever take swimming for granted was was, you know, probably good 60, 70 percent of them, um, because once swimming was taken away, it was like, oh, wait a minute. You know, I, I really do love swimming. I really do enjoy coming to practice and working hard. And so I played off of that as much as I possibly can to keep them excited as much as possible. And then, you know, once we got back in, it was reminding them why they were there. You know, what is their purpose? Um, they're doing something they truly love, but at the same time, we're working hard and, and, and trying to become better. You know, we, we did, I mean, everybody kind of did the same thing, but what we did is, um, uh, you know, in addition to what John was talking about, and, um, you know, I still use it now. You know, because you're always going to have those moments in practice where kids going to be completely spanned or, you know, there's a school or something else happening that's take their focus away. And, you know, I always refer back and I say, hey, you know, just remember how he felt two months ago when you couldn't do it, you know, and you really got to make sure that, you know, when you don't come to practice, there is a real reason behind it. Just remember what it was like when you couldn't do it. But during the actual shutdown, uh, the biggest thing that we try to maintain is a structure. You know, I, um, I explained to kids that when you go on vacation, you don't have a schedule. Um, you know, you, you get up in the morning, you, you know, you go with the family or you do something else, and then you come back swimming two weeks later and just remember how difficult it is to come back. And it's not necessarily physically that it's difficult, but it's mentally because you didn't have any structure. 
you are just, you know, doing things randomly whenever you feel like it, and now you're being put in a box. So one thing that we were determined to maintain um, was to make sure that our kids do things at scheduled times and work whatever else they had to do during the day around those schedules to maintain as much of a normal uh, um, structure in their life to be able to transfer that when we get back into the pool. Physically, you know, it, it was going to be a lot easier than mentally. And I think that doing that structure helped them mentally move on uh, once we got back in the pool. So, guys, talking about culture and developing culture and maintaining culture and, you know, even changing culture. Um, I know you guys have been in a lot of different positions, had a lot of different head coaches, um, gone through, you know, a, a long period of, of, of culture. So I'll throw this to you first, John. But um, what – so you, you started at Bowles. You were there 18 years or something, right? Yep. And so you started there, and who was the head coach, Shof? Uh, Larry Shof. So you started with Shof, and then you had Jeff and Todd, then you had Bishop, and then you had Sergio, and then you. So yeah. talk to me a little bit about how that Bowles culture that Troy developed maintained itself through all those coaches or didn't maintain itself? And how did you as the assistant keep that culture going in that direction, you know, um, or change that culture depending right. on, right. you know? I, I mean, I think the one core aspect of the culture, because you had a lot of different coaches, a lot of different um, assistant coaches in there, even when you have the same head coach, but the assistant coaches change out, you know, it kind of changes your culture a little bit. But overall, um, you know, the one core aspect was, uh, was expectations. We had very high expectations of the athletes. And, and, and I know for a fact that Pinecrest has, has the same expectations. You know, you're coming in as, as a Bulls, Bulls swimmer, Bulls student, Bulls athlete. Um, your expectations are, you know, to be the best person you can, to do well in school, to do well in practice. If you're not holding up to those expectations, you're going to get fussed at. You're going to get yelled at. You're going to get sent home. You're going to get in trouble. Um, you know, we were one of the best things for us was, you know, we took 30, 40 kids to travel meets. You know, we'd be in a hotel. We'd be leaving and, and going out to get on the bus. And, you know, the people in the front desk would be sitting there watching, you know, 40, 50 athletes walk by and they're like, holy cow, we didn't even know you guys were in the hotel. How long were you here? It's like, well, four days. We're like, wow. You know, there was a nine member volleyball team that was here last week and we knew they were there. <coughs> um, so, you know, that kind of thing and, and, and continuing to hold these athletes to those standards. Um, little pieces of the culture changed, how we trained them changed, how we approached things changed, mm -hmm. you know, with each different coach. But the overall was those high expectations. Kids coming into Bulls had those high expectations. They came to Bulls because they knew that they were going to get top-notch coaching. They knew that the expectations for them, for each individual, was going to be, you got to perform at your best, you know, every day or as close to every day as you can. Um, and, and I think that was the big core um, of the Bulls culture. You know, uh Interestingly enough, we always look at bowls and their culture as, as something that, you know, we always strive for. Um, uh, for better or for worse, you know, for in the past 40 years, 90% uh, of the meets would go bowls way. Um, you know, so as, as, as a team that's chasing, you always look to the champ and trying to duplicate and improve on what they do. Um, you know, but uh, John mentioned expectations. Um, uh, I'm going to also bring tradition uh, because uh, both schools have a tremendous tradition. And, you know, we look at our banner, uh, uh, you know, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, um, you know, with all the names, all the all the champions that were, that were part, part of the history. But, uh, you know, I work with Jay Fitzgerald um, and I've known Jay for over 30 years since my mission days, Mission Viejo days. But... Um, when Jay uh, uh, started to move away 
uh, a, a little bit from the sport and uh, then retired uh, three years ago when I took over. One of the things that um, uh, I try to build upon, not necessarily change, but build upon was just general uh, general attitude um, that our swimmers have on a daily basis. Um, you know, we're very fortunate, uh, um, used to be, I don't know what's going to happen moving forward, being able to uh, rent our facilities to some of the best teams and swimmers in the world. You know, we get um, uh, uh, Ben Tintley from Canada. He's pretty much with his uh, uh, core group from Toronto here three, four times a year. That's his home away from home. And we get to watch those those swimmers, what what they do, you know, how they um, carry themselves, uh, you know, what are what are the little things that they do that make them who they are. So uh, one of the things that we started doing is, you know, trying to uh, uh, implement an idea of act like a champion before you become one. And of course, the funny guys, you know, on the team say, "Oh, so you mean I got to stick my chest out and walk around the pool deck like that?" Well, that's not what it is. You know, there are certain traits of a champion that everybody can embrace. It is what you do every single day. Are you the first one in the water? Are you uh, supportive of, of, of your teammates? When you get you get to the pool, are you uh, uh, sitting or are you stretching? Are you doing things that you know are going to help you be a better swimmer? Um, when you're racing, are you engaging, uh, uh, you know, your teammates or are you, you know, doing something else, um, how you carry yourself in and out of the water, in the classroom, that's what makes you a champion. And, you know, you can be that. It doesn't, doesn't take any talent to be that. So, you know, this was one of the big things that we still trying to implement and, and uh, install in our athletes as a core value for our team. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw this out real quick. So if anybody has this, please send it to me because I've been trying to track it down for 10 years. But David Marsh had a list of – it was like rules to be a swimmer, something like that, that he had back when he was at Auburn, when he first started having success at Auburn. And it was a list of things, and I just remember a few of them was like carry your equipment bag, don't drag your equipment bag. And it was simple stuff like be on time, be early you know, things like that. And it was an Auburn list of, of rules to be a swimmer that he created. And I have not been able to track it down. Um, I'm going to text him right now, see if he can share. <laughs> but, um, you know, that was, that was something that I thought, and it goes along with what you're talking about it. You know, it was, it, you know, kind of the old Jerry Rice act like you're supposed to be there. You know, you don't need to do a dance in the end zone. You're supposed to be there. And it was the same kind of thing for practice. And it, it was it was all about the ways that you behave as a swimmer. And I thought that was fantastic. And like I said, I haven't been able to uh, to track it down since. Um, even some of my Auburn buddies, I couldn't they couldn't find it. They knew what I was talking about, but they didn't have a copy of it. And I searched the internet far and wide. So. Now, add, I mean, adding on to that, um, you know, that culture also kind of helps create that team culture and, and having that culture set in place. Now, um, I think it's much easier to build the culture than it is to maintain it. Um, <coughs> it's so easy to get complacent. One year you've got, you know, good leaders. The next year you don't and things crash and burn real quickly. But um you know, one, one of the great things was every year at the beginning of the year, all the new students that are all the new swimmers that we had coming in were able to look up to and, and follow the, the other athletes and kind of ask them, hey, what, you know, what's expected here? What are we supposed to do? So and, and they actually did a real good job um, taking that role on. And, and I think those one of the reasons why I enjoyed having high school season at the beginning of the year was it was a quick way in a, in a simpler way to kind of get everybody on the same page a lot quicker. Um, of course, now January was usually kind of awful because everybody's all over the place, but you know, getting everybody to cheer for each other, getting everybody to understand why we wear the same caps in practice, why we wear the same t-shirt at swim meets, why we always you know, travel uh, in polos and why we, you know, like you said, Brian, carry your bag, don't drag it. All these little things that we take for that people take for granted are just different ways that 
add up into that one big team culture. Um, you know, cheering for your athletes on a hard set or cheering for your teammates, um, being respectful to your coaches, being respectful to your to your teammates, things like that. Um, a lot of little things, not very difficult, but just a lot of little things that that really builds that culture. Hey, John, um, I don't even know if you remember this, but uh, I guess two uh, two years ago was your last year at Bowles. Is that right? Uh, January 2019. Yeah. So uh, fall of 18 convention was in uh, was in Jacksonville and I was down there and Morrison Bauer said, hey, we want to ride over to Bowles. We're going to go watch a practice. And, uh, you know, as a young guy, I, I said, yeah, absolutely. Jump in the car with those guys and drive over there. And I expected to jump in and, and watch, you know, 25 guys going hundreds on a minute and just mm -hmm. absolutely destroying uh, the practice. And uh, one of the things that I thought was really neat and has stuck with me since then was uh, just really a culture moment that I thought, you know, that's why they're really good. Um, young man showed up probably 20 minutes late. Um, he had all the excuses in the world. Um, and you just looked at him and said, you, you've you got all of those things. All of those things are fine, but your teammates are out there and they need you to be in there with them to be successful. And I, I said, I, was, uh, I thought for sure, this is the guy. This is This must be the stud. And, uh, you know, he, he walks and he goes past lanes one and two and you guys are swimming to the outdoor pool and he's past like lanes three and four. And then all of a sudden he's jumping in like lane nine or 10 down there. And I just thought to myself, man, this, this guy just got talked to like he is the bell cow of the entire team and how important he is uh, for the team success. But you talk to him in a way that, that made him understand that his part in it uh, and I think that's really important for age group coaches that that may coach a group of 11 to 14 year olds that that may not necessarily be the top guy in the group or the top girl in the group yet. Um, but they know that their teammates are, are a big part of that. So that was a culture thing for me to see you step in there and just engage that athlete. Uh, is that something that was regular or were you just showing off for us that day? <laughs> no, uh, I mean, to be honest, um, you know, for, for high school swimming, you end up taking about 40 to 45 athletes to states. It's probably about the most you can end up taking. And I know we usually were pretty close to maxing out. I know Pinecrest was pretty close. And you, we had a lot of athletes that we didn't take. And as you look at these athletes and you look at the other schools in Jacksonville, you kind of go, you know what? Every single one of these athletes that we didn't take to the state team would have made state team on another team, you know, so and it was sure. important for us to make sure that we included them because we didn't want to lose them. If somebody got injured, somebody got hurt, or we had a big graduating class, we needed to make sure we had these younger guys moving up. And, um, you know, and I, I repeatedly told them over and over, I didn't care if you were the fastest kid on the team or the slowest kid, you worked your butt off. You got yelled at if you didn't, you, you, you know, you came in, you wore your uniform, you wore your team outfits. We made sure everybody had opportunities to, you know, try to make the team. Um, I told everybody, the fastest kids day one, you're not on the state team yet. You still need to prove yourself throughout the season. Um, we even took a bus of the athletes that didn't make the state team down to the state meet to cheer. You know, so we'd have 30, 40 athletes sitting up in the stands that we specifically brought down and paid for their entry fee uh, to get into the meet so that they could be there and be part of the team. And, and that was very important for us because, I mean, we had a lot of kids that worked hard and, and just unfortunately were not fast enough or were beaten out by a Ryan Murphy or, a, you know, Joseph schooling. And <laughs> what can you do then? That happens um, to the all of us. National record holder beat me out yeah. for the last. Team. I mean, first what are you first do? world problems, right there. Yeah, right, right there. there. That's tough. That's tough. I know everybody yeah, out there argue, that's watching. You know? Everybody can sympathize with that problem, right there. <laughs> having Ryan Murphy and no, but no, but seriously, I thought it was it was just an amazing. It was an amazing conversation. So kudos to you for for that approach. It's, it's pretty awesome. Well, throwing in on top of that, I mean, I when I took over at Buholtz High School in 1996, maybe. Um, I'd grown up in Florida swimming. I'd grown up watching bowls, watching Pinecrest, watching uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, watching 
Um, actually, Dr. Phillips at that time was 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 a powerhouse in the bigger schools. Um, and I, I, I just took away from all those programs a lot of the similarities. And the one thing, one of the best compliments I've ever gotten, and I've mentioned this on the show before, was we were walking into NSPI in Orlando, and my Buholt squad comes walking in. We're all in our uniforms, our black and yellow, our warm-ups, our bags. Like, I mean, we we look like a team, right? And we were good, but we weren't like rock stars. I mean, we weren't we weren't awesome. And um, I remember these two girls in front of us were walking in in front of us, and me and my board president were walking behind them. And the one girl looked at the other girl and goes, man, who's that team? They look like bowls or something. And I went, yes, I have arrived. Like we finally did it. And, um, and it, but, it, but it, <clears throat> having said that, over the next three to four years, we developed an incredible team. And I mean, a team, it was, we were successful in the pool. We were successful out of the pool. You know, we were behaved. We did what we were supposed to. We really, everybody kind of fed off of that mentality. And um, so I think there's a lot to that. Um, and I know Pinecrest, I know you guys did the same thing. I mean, you travel as a squad, you, you know, you, well, you used to, I don't know if you still will now, but, um, but yeah, so I think there's something to be said for that. Um, you know, and I thank you, John and, and, you know, Marius for, uh, for giving me those things. Cause I straight up stole them from you guys. I mean, that's how I built that culture and that team was copying everything you guys were doing. So that, that, thank you that for that. Jay, Gerald from, for us. <laughs> yeah, it probably was Jay back then. I, uh, but yeah, I, um, you know, I just, I love that. That there's something to be said. About there, there's something to be said about high school season that it really brings, I think the best in athletes and coaches. Um, uh, you know, because of, of what the, the, the four time, four months a year or three months a year that you get to really experience such a fast paced, exciting team oriented, um, you know, uh, everyone, everyone in for it, uh, for, you know, in it for, for the team, uh, kind of situation. And, you know, just like when you go to the meets and, you know, you want to be on the relay. It's the same thing. That's the most exciting piece of the meet, you know, being on a relay. Everybody wants to be on it. So the, the three months, uh, in a way, it, it's it's very difficult to duplicate for the next nine months what we are able to do and the kind of attitude that is being created. Um, that's the high point during the year, at least for us. After that, you know, it, it, it becomes a little more difficult keeping everybody focused and uh, keeping everybody engaged the same way. Oh, so right now it's absolutely. Oh, we got everybody. Everybody's on. Let's everybody jump in. Yeah. So yeah, I, I mean to build on that, I, I you know, how do you so how do you develop that mentality, that culture for the younger kids with the club program? And then how do you maintain that for the other nine months out of the year with the older kids? I know that's a pretty broad question, but um oh, you know, so Mario, why don't you go first? So you know, with the younger kids, we're just trying to make sure that the younger kids get engaged and interact with the older kids um, uh, as much as we can. You know, we um, we would do a, a little mini clinics for them um, uh, with the older kids coaching them. Uh, when we have meets, we invite them to be the timers just so they see that. And, um, you know, it also makes our older kids feel a little more responsible. Well, I'm a role model now in addition to everything else we expect them to do. Uh, the next nine months, uh, uh, you know, the, the the way the only way that we're really uh, able to do it is to try to keep that team aspect and and maintain clear focus and team goals moving forward, so they don't lose that team atmosphere. Even though the high school season is over, um, it's not always successful. But uh, you know, we try to do travel meets, which are going to be also very very important in, in maintaining that uh, uh, you know uh, team culture that we're able to create during the three months. But honestly, I have yet to find something that's going to work for the entire 12, 12 months for us. Um, after the three months, it is, it is just trying to uh, stop the bleeding, so to speak. No, that's, uh, that, that's true. You know, especially when you bring kids in, you know, that are new to your team and, and, and you know, you go into these hour and a half dual meets that, you know, boom, 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 you're done. 
you show up, you go home, or, you know, even an invitational where you go down Friday night, you come back Saturday night, then all of a sudden you hit January and, you know, it's a three hour, 400 IM, 500 free on Friday night and four hours on Saturday morning and four hours on Sunday morning. And, you know, kids are looking at you like, well, what do you mean? This is, this is four hours. Uh, I thought we were like an hour and a half, you know, and it's like, well, no. And it's kind of hard to, to tell them, Hey, you know, whenever there's a bowl swimmer in the pool, you need to be, you know, cheering when almost every single heat has a bowl swimmer. So you got to warm up, you got to warm down, you got to get ready. Um, like I said earlier, uh, January is probably the worst because that's kind of that first USA meet um, that's kind of ugly. And, and, you know, they're used to being excited and swimming fast at the dual meets and the championship meets. And then you get to January and it's like, okay, whoa, you know, slamming on the brakes. Um, <laughs> like Marius, we, we weren't, uh, you know, extremely successful, but, you know, we try to, you know, we try to keep talking about, you know, team goals. All right, we're going to senior champs. Um, we're going to sectionals. This is what we're trying to achieve. We, we try to keep them focused on individual goals. Um, you know, the summer was a little bit easier just cause it seemed like there wasn't school to worry about and kids were able to hang out with each other a little bit more, but, um, yeah, I've always thought January, February was probably the, the roughest times. But, but we had all those meets at Cecil field. that were so awesome. Oh God. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so four hours at Cecil field, Woo I, I may be in the minority of people that are either on the show or watching the show, but uh, I'd be in favor of those not coming back in that same manner, to be honest with you. Cause I honestly, from an age group perspective, I don't know if it's that great for the sport to have, you know, 12, 10 and 12 year old kids an hour <coughs> and a half warm ups, And then a four hour session, you know, and you're at the pool for six hours of your day. I think there's going to be some loss of interest that happens. Um, and so hopefully that's something out of all of this, coronavirus stuff that comes out of it is, um, you know, we, we get to a place where we're, where we're creating meets for kids that are more similarly situated. And, and maybe that means there are more meets to go to. I know there's a lot of big financial considerations for that in teams, but um, I'd love to get to a place where, where swimming can be something that people enjoy for a couple hours. Cause you know, the start time and the finish time of the football game, you know, you know the basketball game is going to start at – the tip is going to be at 4, and you're going to be out of there by 5 o'clock. That's just the way it works. But swimming is, you know, you may you may have a 7 o'clock warm-up, and we'll see you again at lunchtime. So, um, you know, I, I hope that's something that, that we address as, as age group coaches, you know, and advocate for things that can be more entertaining. Marius, you've got uh, a history in college swimming, right? Yes. Uh, and that's the that's – the, you know, I tell our high school kids all the time, when you get to college swimming, the fun of a high school meet is ramped up tenfold because it's not about the time. It's about just getting your hand on the wall, just racing. So have you translated that, any of that into your, your team? You know, when we have dual meets, I mean, I use that term quite often, you know, especially when we race bowls. I said, I don't care where <laughs> you go. You just got to get your hand on the wall. Um, you know, but the reason why in college it, it is, you know, like you said, multiply 10 times is because you the whole experience is completely different here kids go home in college you, you're 24 7 with your teammates you know you 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 live through normal everyday life up and down fun and 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 you know and, and tough moments uh with your teammates and and you know you build those relationships that really uh, help you as a team be a better uh, a, a competitor uh but what we try to do, you know, as far as the, the, the team aspect and, you know, and the, the trying to transfer that idea of college to, uh, to uh, high school swimming, what we try to do is just uh, uh, making everybody understand at any given time that the dual meets are not won by the people that win events, you know, especially in college, because in college scoring, you can win an event and lose a dual meet. In high school, at least, you win the you win the event, you win the event. Mathematically, as long as you put up people on the blocks, you're not going to lose that meet, that event. Yeah. In college, you can't. You, you know, you, you need to do better than just finish first and then. So, you know, what we stress is how everybody needs to contribute. And your contributions are not just in the water. They're in, uh, in and out of the water. But if, if you are a swimmer that is in a sixth place, 
uh, in a race and you can move up one spot. That's a two point swing. And, you know, and uh, using examples from college or even just from high school experiences, how many meets came down to less than 10 points? You know, especially in a tough rivalries with, with, with you know, historical uh, uh, competition between schools. So it, it really brings the best in people. And, you know, college college got uh, uh, a little different feel for it. But, you know, I always tell my kids when, you know, when they um, – uh, they ask me a question. Some of them are on the fence, you know, coach, I'm not sure if I'm a college material, you know, I, you know, I, I really want to, you know, try, but I don't know if I'm good enough. And I, you know, there are a lot of opportunities in college to go to. There are so many different levels, but I always tell them that, you know, in my swimming career, I swim at every level. And if I was given a time machine to go back to one year of my life, I wouldn't go back to Olympics or any of that meets. I would go back to college for one year. Um, just to experience that very feel and, and the whole cycle of dual meets, traveling, going to any situation, nothing like it. Hmm. I think, you know, when you're in that dual meet setting, it's much easier to kind of focus on who the enemy is, basically, the us against them. I mean, and that's why when you're in the club setting, you know, the, the kids love the high school. They wear their high school jerseys. They you know, oh, coach, I got to go to high school practice. Oh, coach, I got to high school this, high school that. And because it, it, it's very easy to singularly focus and go, okay, we got to beat that team. You know, when we were fortunate enough to have years where we took, you know, 20, 30 kids to winter juniors and stuff like that, you know, they swam so much better, so much stronger because they felt that need that, does, you know, it was like, okay, here's the three top teams. We got to make sure we get our hand on the wall in front of them. So there was more than there was more to the meet than just showing up and racing. And that was also one of the attractions where, you know, we get a lot of athletes that came to bowls that most of them came from small teams because they'd be at junior nationals by themselves and the coach and they'd see 20 bowls athletes come in and stretching together and talking together and hanging out together. And I was like, well, I want to be part of that, you know, and, and that that right there is what keeps them going and what keeps them swimming fast. So, yeah, I mean, you get to a, a, a four hour club meet or, you know, you're a, a five team, you know, a five member team at, at a senior champs or sectionals or something like that. And it's kind of like, you know, woohoo, who are we competing against? Who are we trying to beat? Um, you get to the dual meet. It's, it's like, we're trying to beat that guy. You know exactly who your competition is and you know what your goal is. And it, it, it's a, it becomes a singular focus. It's much easier to, to come together, focus on that one thing, and go. You know, what, what so, got me... Go no, go ahead, Marish. Go ahead. What got, me, what got me hooked on swimming in the United States was uh, I came here in 86. And I was very fortunate to be on a large team. I was in Mission Viejo. And we went to 87... Uh, spring nationals, my very first big meet. I uh, we went to US Open, but there wasn't a team competition. But went to '87 in Mission Bay, so there is a little bit uh, added spice to it because Mark left Mission Viejo, <laughs> took a lot of swimmers to Mission Bay, is building the powerhouse there, and we go in there to swim at nationals. And um, I've never experienced a, a, a team aspect. Uh, you know, even being uh, uh, on the national team in Poland, I mean, uh, we would travel the basic necessity. You know, to any big meet, you only took people that qualify, you know, they're, they're very tough time standards, you know, to go there. So even like we'll go to Olympics, we never had relays before. Now they do. So the first experience of the team aspect was when I went to Mission Viejo. And I remember just going crazy, doing kind of stuff that I never thought I would do. I, I, I got a haircut with the MVN on the back of my head, <laughs> uh, you know, just completely getting into it, you know, dressed up, having equipment, you know. And, and I remember sitting there on the pool deck. And it, it's national, spring national, but still national. So it's a prelims finals. It's not a short meet. I mean, I was on the edge of the seat, the, the whole, and the whole team was like that, the whole meet. You know, and that's what John is talking about. When you go in there and you have a huge team goal with that, with a lot of support staff around you, uh, you, you know, you're all wearing the same uniforms. You identify yourself with something bigger than yourself. Uh, it just brings such an incredible atmosphere. And, you know, I didn't know if I was going to go to college in the U.S. 
Um, I ended up just going out to try it out. But after, again, after after one semester, you know, I knew I was I, I'm, I'm staying. There was no way I'm leaving this. Uh, you know, I can't do. You can't duplicate it. So uh, high school is same kind of a very unique time of the year that uh, it becomes very difficult. I would say, you know, based on our conversation here, close to impossible to duplicate the same kind of um, energy year round. Right. You know, and, and, and it affected training. So at bowls, you know, the kids that went to bowls trained at one time and the kids that didn't go to bowls, your non bowl students trained later. And, you know, and that coach would always complain every year during high school season. Well, I only get to see him, you know, three times a day. They're going to be out of shape. They're going to be this. They're going to not, they're not going to swim while I'm like, hold on. It's high school season. They're going to swim fast. You're yeah. going to have kids that are going to swim so fast that you'll never see it the rest of the year, except during high school season. And you're going to scratch your head and go, how the heck did they did that, do that? Because they may not have worked as hard as you would have liked. They may not have come to every single practice you would have liked, but they still swam fast. Why? Us against them. There was that singular purpose that the whole team had the same goal of beating those guys. You know, I also feel that, you know, because there was all, there, there were arguments sometimes about moving our high school season till January. And, you know, there are some things that I might enjoy about that. But what I really like about high school season starting in August is, you know, in addition to, you know, starting the year the same way, is, is we're coming off of the summer. And, and let's face it, summer kids have no school. You know, they're going to be able to sleep. They're going to be able to rest in between. The quality of work that you get done during the summer carries over into the high school season. And then you bring that energy. It's a win-win. Absolutely. You know, and, and like you said, it was the best way to get everybody on the same page on day one of swimming quickly. Because everybody had that singular purpose. Yeah. That's awesome. Hey, Brian, so you guys, you guys are, uh, and John now working with Brian, you guys are a, a gigantic team. What I would classify as a gigantic team. I mean, uh, yeah, I'm, uh, yeah. Yeah. So um, you guys have, have the unique challenge of, of bringing all of those people onto, um, onto the same, onto the same page. How, I mean, is it even possible to get that singular focus um, from even a club team with multi sites and coaches coaching, you know, linear groups at different sites, is it even possible? What I mean, what yes. do you guys try to do? So, uh, I, I would least, go ahead, Brian. Um, I, I would say that the one thing that we're very lucky um, to have is have Nitro and Fleet and a handful of other teams in the state of Texas, and have the tags meet. Um, because that is the one meet from an age group standpoint, 14 and under, where that's the only meet that we really go to 14 and under that we're not confident we're going to win. Um, we have to be ready when we go to tags. And I think that that is something that we have done an excellent job at Lakeside the three years I've been here um, of rallying the troops, getting everybody on the same page, giving out the team gear, doing all that stuff. I mean, we, we roll out the red carpet for the tax kids. Um, and we take that meet just as seriously as any other meet. Our top 14-year-olds, 13-year-olds, even if they're junior national level, they go to tags. Um, they might go to something else after tags, but they go to tags. Um, we go into that meet with the mentality of trying to win it. And that's our mentality every year since I've been here. Um, and I think that's the one thing that kind of, kind of brings us back down, um, back down onto the level. Um, but I don't know, John, what do you think? I mean, I, I've seen a lot, I know coaches from a lot of different teams. I've watched a lot of multi-site teams and, you know, I remember, you know, Dynamo or not Dynamo, uh, Swim Atlanta back in the day. I mean, they had multiple sites, but when you watched them at a swim meet, it was like eight different teams that showed up and, you know, you kind of watch them and you're like, okay, there's this 15,000, you know, not to pick up, <coughs> there's this 15,000 member swim program. Why aren't they winning junior nationals and senior nationals every year? Um, you know, so it, it, it you kind of see both. I feel like, you know, 
Um, our head coach, Jason, I think has done a very good job in trying to keep in touch with everybody and keeping everybody on the same page. And I think that that really helps contribute to us, the LAC, you know, moving in the same direction. Um, obviously, each site has its own challenges and its own unique, um, you know, pieces to it. And, and, he, and, and we're allowed to, to be ourselves. But at the same time, you know, we're LAC. We have a we have similar goals. We have similar focuses. We want to go to tags. We want to beat the heck out of everybody. We want to go to, um, you know, we want our athletes to go to the high school meet and be able to go. That's ours. That's ours. That's ours. That's ours on the podium. We want to go to junior nationals and win. So there is that common goal. There is that common focus that when we come together as a team at a swim meet um, at these bigger meets, we are trying to beat everybody else. We are trying to go, hey, there's, there's this many swimmers in our program. Uh, we should be winning and we need to. Mariush, is that the same way you guys uh, approach Florida age group meet? Uh, you know what? A little different because we don't go to flags. Um, uh, you know, we, we go to our local JOs. That's our main meet um, for 14 and unders. Um, and then after that, that's where it becomes a little challenging, uh, you know, trying to find a team aspect, um, you know, where we can really showcase, you know, senior champs is going to be probably the closest one that we can come to. But senior champs falls in, uh, in, a, in a time frame that uh, there are other meets that we want to take, especially our better kids too. So it just becomes kind of very difficult keeping everybody focused on the same page. And one unique thing about high school season, again, is that there's one purpose. Um, and, and everybody goes to the same meet at the end of the season. You know, unlike uh, uh, John and Balls, we were, uh, you know, 99% of the time, we were not facing a situation where we had to leave anybody behind. And if we did, it was mostly girls. For whatever reason, you know, our boys' team was always a little smaller, not for whatever reason. I know the reasons. You know, everybody wants to play football and baseball. But, uh, you know, so it becomes a little challenging. But uh, we, we started experimenting with going to uh, South Florida meets uh, outside of our LSC and taking a, a bigger and bigger groups and trying to make that into a competition uh, uh, kind of environment where we try to, you know, uh, go for team points and things like that. So it's a work in progress. Just got to explore opportunities. And, and you know, creating the culture – uh, that's going to buy into that kind of thing. Uh, you know, the, our, our headwinds are with school expectations, um, not being able to really get everybody to commit to that outside of the high school season because there's SATs, there's something else that's going to be coming up. There are tutors, there are class, you know, they all have their own path that they take. And, you know, so, but like, like I said, it's a work in progress and we're seeing some positive results from that. But the recipe is to find a common goal beyond the three months of the year. That's good stuff. What? Uh, all right, guys, before we got workouts coming up in just a few minutes. But before we do, I want to ask you guys something. But if you had to put, you know, a, a thing or a couple of things as a core concept of your success, John, while you were the 18 years at Bowles or, or now at Lakeside, Mariusz, now at Pinecrest, what would you say have been those kind of core concepts of your program. I know, John, you said earlier, high expectations. Anything else? Uh, I mean, I think, you know, and when I say high expectations, that's high expectations per the kid. I mean, I don't expect, you know, a Ryan Murphy and a kid that can barely break a minute in the 100-yard freestyle. You know, I expect them both to work hard. I expect them both to do certain things, but I don't expect that kid to go, you know, 42 in the 100-yard free. Um, so it, it's – it's relative to each athlete, um, but the high expectations, um, the professionalism, but I think most important is, is just bringing my passion for the sport of swimming to the pool each and every day. Um, if the kids know that I'm excited to be there, they're going to be more excited to be there. You know, you joke around with them, you tease them, you, you, you talk to them, you, you engage them in, in conversation outside of swimming. Hey, how was that piano recital last night? You know, and just the fact that you remember that is, is, is huge. Um, and that's, those are the two big, you know, a couple big things. And then you get down to the goals and the team goals and that sort of thing. But I think bringing the passion to swimming, that high expectation and, um, you know, that's the key. So, John, I'm going to be that guy. and I'm going to ask the question. 
Um, Go for it. So is that is that why you made the decision that you made at Bowles? I mean, were you having a hard time bringing that that energy and that focus every day because of the grind of the school and everything else and the the parents and all that? Were you, were you is that why you made the decision you made? Because I you know myself and I know a lot of my friends, we were all pretty surprised when you announced, "Hey, I'm done in January. I'm out." You know, uh, um, no. Um... I mean, it's easy to point for me to point to that and go, yeah, that's why I'm leaving. But the reality of it is, is the grass isn't always greener on the other side. You're still going to deal with parents. You're still going to deal with the grind. I mean, right now I haven't had a day off in, you know, since Labor Day because, you know, thank you, COVID. Um, you know, my weekends are worse than during the week. Um, honestly, the big reason was I'd been there for so long. Um, I, I you ready just, for a change. I just wanted something different, you know. Maybe you can call it a midlife crisis. Um, instead of buying a Porsche <laughs> or a, you know a BMW, I went and you know quit your job, live somewhere else. <laughs> um, quit yeah, one of the best really, jobs in the country. <laughs> yeah, really, it was it was a change. It was it was a desire to do something different. It was a desire to see a different format, a different thought process, a different type of kid. Um, you know, it, it's a grind wherever you go. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm <laughs> super thankful and, and very excited, you know, excited about my years at Bulls. And, and I, I don't have anything negative to say, you know, it was a lot of work. Absolutely. But I mean, look what we accomplished, you know? Um, so no, uh, it's, it's completely. A I'm just curious. I mean, I heard you talking about it. That's why I asked. Something else. So. Uh -oh. so, we're, being, we're being queued. We're getting queued to the main set. Before we do, Mariusz, real quick, what would you say is that that thing for you? Uh, what we just talked about? Um, you know, respect, um, relationships, and energy. Um, don't expect your kids to respect you if you don't respect them. Um, don't expect what John mentioned. Don't expect your kids to buy into your program if you don't want to know them as people you know uh they're, they're they're not just machines in the water there's life beyond it and if you show interest they will give you more and you know the energy is same thing with what john was saying that uh, you know i always consider myself a, a, a very positive person and um and i try to bring the energy to practice you know um we, we don't get up every morning to go to practice and and gonna have a smile on our face but i make that happen I make sure that I'm energetic. I make sure that I'm that person that is getting in everybody's faces and, you know, dancing on the pool deck in the morning and high-fiving people to show that I'm excited to be here. Because if I'm excited, I know they're going to get excited. So those are the kind of things that, so, you know. Marius, what about when it drops below 70 over there? Are you still excited? What? When it drops below 70 on the pool deck, are you still oh excited? Oh, my God. Yeah, that, that, you know, that's a joke. My kids were already joking because <sighs> – 72 couple of days ago and they asked me coach where is your parka and your glove <laughs> you know, when, we, when we get to 70s i'm usually wearing sweats when we get to 60s it's parka gloves and a hat <laughs> and i'm you awesome. know i'm not ashamed i'm not trying to impress anybody I, want to <laughs> I love it all right it's time we gotta we gotta push forward to our main set i know we got a couple workouts here and i think brian is this one yours no this is john John, there it is. John, this is a, a workout. Uh, you want to kind of take us through the, the workout? Just kind of tell us what you were, what you wanted from the athletes during that time? Um, yeah, I mean, obviously we got some warm up. We got some paddle work, just kind of working on, you know, the stroke and, and the catch. I don't know. I don't know if I can scroll down or you guys scroll down uh, through the main set. Who scrolls? Me? No, no Joe's Jay. got it. Joe's got to scroll. So, there we go. you know, the first part is just kind of getting everybody warmed up and ready to go. Um, so this is an IM set. Um, typically, when I do my most of my IM sets, I don't do straight up IMs very often. Uh, we'll do that more at the end of the year uh, just because, you know, I got tired of watching kids. You know, they swim the butterfly and we get to the backstroke and it's just slow. <sighs> you know, and the breaststroke is slow and freestyle, they pick it up. So I want to work the different strokes uh, separately and I want them to swim the different strokes separately. So, you know, if we look here, we've got uh, some freestyle where it's two 100s kind of easy and then a 100 
um, on 105 or 110. Um, now these are 13, 14 year olds. Uh, trying to get them get them used to swimming 105 base, you know, interval. We'll grow that from 100 on 105 to later on, you know, five or six of them. Um, butterfly the back and the breast on a very tight rest interval. They've got that 25 freestyle to kind of recover. Um, but I want them swimming that fly fast. I want them swimming that backstroke fast. I want them swimming that breaststroke fast. You know, when they swim the IM, I want them to be able to do all four strokes and feel like there's no one stroke that hurts them. You know, we got a breaststroker who sprints the, or, you know, a kid that's bad at breaststroke sprints the flying back to try to get as far ahead as they can, but we know that doesn't help them. So if I can get all four of their strokes, you know, improve their ability to swim it fast. And then the second half of the season, start putting it together. So, you know, middle of the season, you'll start seeing, you know, 50s fly back or 75s, 50 fly, 25 back working on that transition. And then the last part of the season, um, you'll start seeing more IM. So, yeah, that's about the gist. So, of hey, John, I think I, I think I know the answer to this. Just want to confirm for people out there that are, are going through that with you. There's 200s at the end or between at the end of the four rounds or the end of the eight rounds. That's not in at the end of each round, right? Right. That's um, yeah. So they go the eight rounds, uh, fly free, fly free, fly free, and then the 200. So a little bit of active okay. recovery, let them, let them finish the OMG of, Oh my God, that was awful fly and help <laughs> them kind of reset for the backstroke. I like it. It's good stuff. All right, Joe, we got a uh, Mariusha's workout. We got one up there. Oh my, I don't know. There we go. Mariusha, you're up. Scroll, scroll to the one on the bottom. <laughs> no, 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 no. Let's go up. Let's go up. <laughs> I recognize that bottom set. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How many? How many kids would get excited about doing that today? Yeah. Oh, one. I got one that might. You got one? Yeah. yeah. That's about it, though. I, I think I could convince my daughter to do it only because she would have to. <laughs> Um, so, uh, I, you know, this is what we did this last Saturday, and um, um, uh, we're not racing. We're not doing dual meets. Um, uh, so we, we, we've been getting up on the block quite a bit, but uh, uh, at the end of the week, I just wanted to do a lactate set um, on a very short rest. Um, so everything else in, in, in the middle was kind of leading up to it with a little bit of aerobic set. So uh, a, a warm-up, we usually do the same basic thing um, with the forehand just to get in. And uh, uh, try to work our legs, uh, not too much, uh, unless it's a leg day, but not too much, just to warm it up a little bit. And then the set that's next after that uh, is for IMers mainly, uh, but it is for anybody. We don't get to do yards very often um, because our long course pool is set up long course. We cannot change it. So the timing of what we do uh, as far as the turns becomes very difficult. So pretty much every time we get into a yard pool, we, we try to do sets where we're going to be focusing on turns and try to accelerate the turns and just work kids that, you know, so they can get their timing for the turns. Um, then the four by 425 max speed, uh, uh, all of it freestyle, just kind of uh, getting their pulse up a little bit before we get into the main uh, uh, aerobic set, which was just 10 100s on 130 uh, uh, um, at your best plus 10. Hold it steady. And then the next part is something that's an evolving animal. Uh, at the beginning of the year, people start with A time and they keep trying to improve on that. So everybody is trying to do it in two second increments. So uh, the idea is that they know they can make three. Um, and if they make three, then they can go to, uh, 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 you know, and try to do that time, do that set. And then if they repeat that set twice, and we do this kind of set long course yards at least twice a week. Um, uh, you know, if they do that set twice comfortably and make all four, they can drop the send off by two seconds. And next time they try to challenge themselves at the next level. Uh, dynamic butterfly, it's something that we just started, you know, and you always use for something that's going to be a little less uh, associated with uh, uh, any kind of negative. And butterfly has some negative undertone because of, you know, uh, history of growing up and things like that. But I, I, I'm tired of watching lazy butterfly. Uh, you know, a lazy butterfly is that high out of the water, your arms start getting wider, your kick falls apart, your hips drop. 
So we came up with the term dynamic butterfly, and we do dynamic butterfly uh, uh, at least every other day. Not a long set, uh, but just something that is going to be uh, looking for certain cues, acceleration on exit, chin on the water, making sure your hips are up, making sure your, your knees bend and you get a good kick to support your upper body. Uh, keeping it even a little narrower than normal because, you know, with the lazy butterfly, our kids will tend to start getting wider and wider and higher and higher. It just falls, you know, uh, all goes to hell. Um, then the next one is just kind of stretch it out, uh, narrow and long. All, all it is just, you know, high elbow and uh, full, you know, distance per stroke, full extension. And the main set was 850s from a dive. And what we do, you know, we try to bring excitement. So we do one hit at a time. So we've got, uh, you know, if we have 24 kids, we're going to have a three heats. You're going to have one heat that's going to be swimming down, one heat that's going to be in the bleachers watching and cheering, and one heat that's, that's racing. And uh, you, get, you get a lot more out of kids that way. But whatever you do, it has to add up to a real distance, either 200 or 400. So it's not, a, you know, ordering pizza. Can I go two breaststroke, one freestyle, and two backstroke? You either add it up to 2 IM, 4 IM, 400 freestyle, or two strokes. Oh, I like it. What's, uh, what's that set at the bottom there, Joe? Look at that. That is my favorite set in college. That's a Frank Bush set in college. I used to do that set at least once a year. Yeah, I don't have anybody doing that in my uh, age group program right now. I'll be <laughs> honest with you. <laughs> I don't have any kids that would sign up for that. So. Yes. You know what? And, and, and with that said, with that said, all on a minute base, huh? Yeah, Ooh. but with that said, when when I was finished with two one thousands, the rest of it felt like a swim down. <laughs> you know, I was already in a groove. If I if I got through the two one thousands, you know, the rest of it didn't matter because it, it was just going to keep getting easier. It's such a mental aspect of that. And, and and again, I mean, we've trained John and I. We've trained for this kind of stuff. Yeah. So this, this, you know, this was. Uh, not scary. I mean, if you would bring it to any of the kids today, um, you know, I, 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 I think we have to call nine one one with the heart attack because yeah. it just be overwhelming to even wrap your mind around it. And you know, yeah. again, different yeah. times. I'm looking at what we're doing now because of COVID, and I know I've changed even more. Uh, you know, I, 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 we, we we're trying to do more with less time. And, uh, you know, uh, so it, it, it really, the creativity of what you do changes. And the days of two 1000s, two 800s, um, you know, at least uh, from my point of view, not there. Yeah, not just two 1000s, two 1000s on 10 minutes. On the minute. And then, 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 then following yeah. it up. I mean, doing that set going 10,000s down, uh, that's, yeah, like Mario said, after you get through the thousands, it's like, ah, oh, this is a piece of cake. Yeah, uh, you know, I'm just glad I was never prevented uh, presented something like that going the other way. I was like, nah, oh yeah, that would be. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, go the other way. Build up to a thousand. Uh, sprint up to. Yeah. No, thank you. Well, guys, um, I, I know I probably speak for Brian too, but we just want to say thank you for taking time out of your weekend. This is uh, this has been awesome. Love uh, love the culture and rivalry you guys have had at uh, at Pinecrest and Bulls, and now you know. Good luck to both of you guys in the in the high school season coming up. Marius, you guys have districts Wednesday? Wednesday, correct, yep. Yeah. All right. And John and Brian, you guys, your kids are all in high school season there as, as well as ours are here in Alabama. Yeah. So our six month long, long high school, school season. season. Uh -huh. Same here. Same here. So all right, guys, everybody out there, thanks for tuning in. And uh, we hope to see you guys again next week. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Join us on the swim monkey. Swim, swim monkey, swim monkey, swim monkey, swim monkey, monkey TV, TV, TV on the monkey. <laughs>